you sign it, you send it back. First thing I did, I challenged their authority of which to infringe upon private property. I said, I want it in writing. So they sent me back a bunch of ORAS stuff that didn't even have relevance to the subject matter. So I wrote him another one. I said, the documents I received to you from you on such and such a date are, are uh, totally irrelevant and have no bearing on the subject matter at hand. Would you please uh, once again request that you provide with the proper authority and jurisdiction? So they fussed around and sent one more document, so I countered that. And then they said, well, now that he doesn't have a permit, you've got an oversized rock pile. In Oregon, <laughs> in, under administrative law, you can only have 5,000 yards per year that you crush. And you've got a rock crusher there, been there forever. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I wrote an affidavit of fact. And I stated to the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, I said, identified who I was, identified that my family lived up the road there for the last 65 years, and that the very fact that I can personally testify and will testify in a court of law of the fact on behalf of Wildwood Cop that in fact that pile of rock is not in excess of 5,000 yards. And I gave them my my resume. I've been a managing consultant for 19 years of mineral development, rock crushing, and whatever. I've owned rock crushers. I was in the crushing business for about 12 and a half years. I know a pile of rock when I see one. <laughs> and I stated that. And I said, furthermore, I said, here's the problem that you people have from the government. I said, now you're in violation of federal law, Title 18, Section 242, 241 and 242. And I think I addressed that in the book. It's called deprivation of right under color of law. Here a man has a land patent, has had it since 1840, 1842, whatever it was. And they're claiming jurisdiction over something that they have no jurisdiction over. And now they're uh, committing fraud against him by misrepresenting the value and the quantity of his personal property, his rock. And I said, I'm going to testify on his behalf of the criminal activity. And I gave him my background in law. And I said, the other problem that we have here is the very fact that this man has been an outstanding citizen and a contribution to the community for over 80 years. The man was 82 years old. And to me, that's absolutely criminal for an agency to come after a man that has spent his life, paid his taxes, and been a benefit to the county, to the state, to the production of food, etc. And I wrote on my document to them, and I said, shame on you. I said, I think I'm going to file criminal charges against you myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned to you but I'm in the final stages of getting my private attorney general certificate. Congress allowed three different departments to litigate court cases. Number one is the United States Attorney General. The second one are the state attorney generals. And the third one is the private attorney general. Attorneys have no standing to lawfully litigate cases in court. And I can prove it. I have the documents. So I have submitted the documents to Washington, D.C., to the Senate Judiciary Committee to receive my certificate for a duly authorized and sanctioned uh, uh, private attorney general. And when I get that, I'm going after some people. <laughs> I am sick to death. I'm sick to death of them taking unlawful agency positions. And we have, a, we have a need for lawful government, folks. I don't deny that a minute. And I'll support that to the hill. But the moment they start stepping on private property and private rights and start taking, rather than being a servant of the people, I'm going to sue them on constructive trust fraud. And what's beautiful about that, their own doings prove their guilt. All I got to do is go to the public record, pull it, get it certified, file my suit as my exhibit, 
I have won a number of those. And I know how to do it. Yes? Constructive trust fraud. Every elected official is a constructive trust agent. By the very fact of elected by you, the king, for them to be the servant to do your business relative to your government. When they violate that fiduciary, they take the constitutional oath. That constitutional oath states that they will uphold the Constitution and protect your rights. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit for the sake of time. And I sue them under constructive trust fraud. Because what they're doing is fraudulent. And I've got court cases galore. You wouldn't believe my court file. I got warehouses full of court files. I got a computer that's got 31,000 cases on it. In one, I've got 5,300 that I haven't even looked at yet. So I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with the girls that do. But I study. Yes. <laughs> Yes. You bet. Thank you for asking. The question was, would I define what color of law is? I will give you a prime example. <coughs> Driver's license. Politicians hate for me to bring this up, and I love it. <coughs> In other words, a color of law is presented to you, the public, on the basis that this is the law. When in fact the law is here, this sounds like, looks like, appears to be, but it's a phony. A counterfeit $100 bill, if I can use the analogy, okay? Under color of law, that's an intent to commit fraud in the first instance. It is committing fraud in the second instance. And it also is a violation of the fact of full disclosure. Full disclosure is a very important term that you need to understand. When you sign a document for a driver's license, the state never, never divulges to you what you're giving up of right in order to receive a permission. That's color of law. You in real estate especially, Boy, their disclosure's got to be made about everything in there, or supposed to be. And instead of our people, and that's why our elected officials are so important, you need to get people, and the Bible tells us that we need people with a godly heart. The second thing along with a godly heart is people who read, know, and understand the Constitution. And if we're going to fix this problem that we have in government, we had better pay attention to who we put into office. Thank you very much. It makes me ill to hear some of the justification of some of the people of why they, oh, I like the way he combs his hair, so I'll vote for him. <laughs> when in fact, he sells them out at every vote. <laughs> but color of law simply means that it is not the truth. They're proclaiming it to be the truth, but it's actually an actuality, a misrepresentation of the fact. That's what color of law is. I want you to go, it's in my book, to Title 18, USC, stands for United States Code, Section 241 and 242. Okay? Title 18, Section 241 and 242. Did that answer your question? Okay. Alrighty. Go to page 121 quickly. These two pages here represent what I did because I acquired my property by virtue of a quick claim deed and not by a land sales contract. What you will put in, the, in replace of this on yours will be the copy of your warranty deed, just one paper or two at the most that has your name, the buyer, the date you bought it, and the property description. That's what goes here. Okay? Page 220, or 121, 
122. Both of these documents are part of my quick claim deed when I acquired the property. That's what you put there. Yes, sir. Does it matter if the property is in a trust? It depends. The question was, does it matter whether the property is in a trust? It depends upon whether the trust is the owner or the holder of the property. The patent has to be brought forward in the individual's name. It cannot be a trust or color of law. Just so you know. When we use them in administrative circles, it has its function. But in reference to law, L-A-W, it is a color of law. It's used only in an administrative jurisdiction, yes. So if you have an LLC that is owned by you, and you have an adjacent contiguous property that is maybe your primary residence, that... But that's an administrative jurisdiction creation. So that works. Well... Even though the LLC is still owned by you. The LLC cannot own a land patent unless it was acquired from an individual as a patent. Okay. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. I just one question on what you said earlier about the three witnesses. Yes. Now, I believe the courthouse requires anything to be recorded to be notarized. And a notice on your example is notarized. Yeah. So... I'm just giving you the example that if you want to have it notarized, it's fine. No, I would rather not. But is it a requirement to have something recorded at the courthouse that it be notarized to be recorded? No. Okay. They may claim it is, but I can tell you that it doesn't. Before they had notaries, everything was witnessed. Okay. Yes. Do the witnesses all need to be present at the same time? Can you collect them over time? You can as long as it's dated when they witness. But the problem with that, let me clarify that, they're witnessing your signature. Right. So they need to be there, whatever. Okay? Yeah. So witnesses need to witness each other as well as you. Right. Right. That's the way to properly do it. Yes. And non-family members. No, it can be a family member. A family member. There's someone to prove that you signed that document. Okay. I may have a dumb question, but on this whole document, the first document on page 118, can the margins be changed so that you can fit it, like, on one sheet of paper? I'm sorry. Say again? Can the margins and things be changed, any of the spacing, so that you can fit it on just the front and the back? Reformat. Reformat. Yeah, you can. The only problem with that, when the people go to look at it, it's amazing. We have found how many people look at these documents hung on the bulletin board. I mean, the pages are torn and fingerprints and lipstick and candy bars and, you know, you hear what I'm saying. And if you're trying to keep that on the board, then when you pull that paper, you're pulling against those pegs. So you should print these on separate pages? I would recommend it. You can do what you want, but you have to answer it. But you can put it on both sides. I'm just saying a little more practical if you can lift one page up at a time. Gotcha. Whatever. For the sake of another three or four pages of paper. Pardon? No, this can be done on eight and a half. They're all accepted now, eight and a half, eleven. When you had legal paper before. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Page 123. This is a summary of chain of title. You can do this how you want. Yes, Dick? Yeah, it can be on eight and a half by eleven. But when you go to record it, you have formatting requirements placed on the documents by the recorder. You have to have the top three-inch margin and the one-inch margin on both sides and the bottom from the first page. The subsequent pages, you need a one-inch margin all the way around. Yeah. Otherwise, if you don't follow that rule, it will cost you an extra ten bucks. 
I've not ever had an issue with that, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Page 123. Summary of chain of title. I recommend that you do it like this for several reasons. Number one is the fact it's very easy to read. When you look at that and you look at my example there, it's very neat and clear to read in it. And that's what you want. The left-hand column is always your seller. Is the seller. The little tiny deal in two says two. In other words, who you're conveying your land to. The middle column is the buyer, the recipient, whatever you want to call it, the grantee. And the right-hand column is the date that that document was executed. Now, this will be difference in number depending upon how many is in your chain of title. Somebody was mentioning there that they only had three. I've seen four pages of this stuff. Is that the date it's recorded or the date it's signed? I'm sorry? The date it's recorded or the date it's signed? You want to do it the date on the document that it's signed. And the reason for that, it coincides with your paperwork. Okay? The date that it was recorded, that can vary and you can chase it all over the place. Okay? Any questions on the summary of chain of title? This, by the way, is absolutely required. And you have your documents at home that are all certified in a nice box. You don't want to put them all in the same place. You got a safe deposit box. I would take and put one copy there. Do not have them in the same place. We've had several instances of fire and burglary, and they took all the documents. The fire burnt the place down. Had to start all over. Okay? Proper planning. All right, next page, 125. This is another notice page. This notice page is to anyone attempting or trying to challenge your standing and your land patent. This notice is to form any person who has a lawful standing. Now, notice you want to describe what I said here. A lawful standing. Not somebody that wants to come and bitch because you're doing what you're doing. Okay? Which means they've got to bring some valid paperwork to you and say, hey, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Don't be afraid to talk to someone if that's the case. Find out what it is that's going on so that you know. Notice to inform any person who has a lawful standing to view this file and who wishes to review the complete file on record may do so by requesting an appointment. Now, what I'm trying to say in this document, folks, you're in the driver's seat. Okay? You're the boss. You're the king. they got to come to you. When can we do it? You tell them when, where, what time, ta-da-ta-da-ta-da. They cannot dictate to you because you're the holder of the patent. You're the king. And I listed items that I put in mind. Notice number one, I, Ron Gibson, set the time, date, and place for the review of my documents. No exceptions. I'm not going to let anybody else who doesn't own best my land that I do to dictate to me what I'm going to do or not do. And I don't say that to be a hard pass, so to speak. I say that simply because if you start letting the tail wag the dog, you're going to get in trouble. Yes? I'm sorry. I just have to ask this. You keep talking about the king, but I'm looking at your example of a chain of title, like Steve and, Sim like Steve and Simone Nix. And I'm only asking this because this is reality. Divorce happens 68% of the time in America. So when you have a land patent and it's under two names and there's a divorce, 
you say that you have protection from authority, mm -hmm. what happens? The divorce court can't affect that land patent. Can't, can't. Cannot. Cannot. Okay. Out of their jurisdiction. So what, what, did, what did I share with you about the court of competent jurisdiction? What did I address who has authority to address a land patent? A divorce court judge has no authority to affect that property. So in your experience of doing this... And I've had cases like that. So what happens? It forces the two people to come to some mutual agreement. So, so one, who negotiate there you go. Okay. They're the two that entered into that. They're the two that's got to solve it. You keep the courts out of it. And this forces the courts out of it. You hear me? Okay. Before we leave the uh, chain title, Pardon? Before we leave the chain of title, uh, I know we have. Um, so you go to a title company and they do the research, you pay them 15, 20 bucks for the research, then you rebuild the chain of title like this for your packet. Do you need it certified? Certified. Everything that you get relative to your original package of gathering information needs to be certified from those documents and you create this, the title company isn't going to do that. No, no. So this document shows in the packet as an uncertified page. But you have your title company search elsewhere certified. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, number two, I, Ron Gibson, have the summary, the chain of title included in this file. I'm just reminding everybody that I got my ducks in a row. Okay, I have it. Okay, notice number three, this document is the total of whatever number of pages. And yours will be different than mine, you, in normal course. The reason that you put the number of pages, you are documenting the number of pages in reference to what actually is there. So make sure you do the proper count, okay? <coughs> then somebody can't say, there's a page missing from here. Irregardless of whether it is or not, there's always that. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Put the number of pages in. Okay? Then, bottom notice, failure of any lawful party claiming an interest to bring forward a lawful challenge as a lawful challenge. It has to be a lawful challenge. In other words, there's got to be some substance to what they bring to you to your attention today. We need to talk about this. Okay? A lawful challenge to this certificate of acceptance of declaration of land patent and the benefit of the original land patent, original land grant, and forward slash patent, as stipulated herein will be let and estoppel to any and all parties claiming an interest forever. In other words, you're telling them that unless you come forward in that 60 days with lawful documents after the 61 day period, because you've got the exception of the one day when you first posted, they are forever barred from reasserting a claim against your property. Okay? Yes? Um. Two questions, that at the end of your 61 days, they are forever barred, okay. And then in this paragraph you just read, the word latched, L-A-C-H-E-D, what is that? That means that anything that adheres to it, that tries to go on on it, tries to attach to. So it is spelled L-A-C-H-E-D, yeah. okay. <laughs> yes, it's a legal term for statute of limitations. Pardon? The legal term for statute of limitations. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Failure to make a lawful claim indicated here within time. Calendar of the 60 days of this notice will forever bar any claimant from any claim against my or our colonial patent estate as described herein and will be final judgment. Period. Okay? 
The next page on page 20, 126 is a, this is a photograph of my actual path. It's kind of hard to read, but your document will go in place of mine there, okay? The original. Whatever you, you've had. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you, Ron. Appreciate you all the information. You've got to go pick somebody up at the airport. Yeah. Those documents that you see from page 118 through 126 are the documents that you put in your land patent sandwich when you go to post it on the bulletin board or whatever kind of building. Is there any question about what we've covered in that? This whole package has to be posted? All of these pages. You're only going to have seven, six, seven, eight, or nine pages as a general rule. Take you some the, the pegboard deal with the little buttons on them, you know, to stick it on a bulletin board. And they go in this order? Pardon? They go in this order? Yes, in this order. How many of the community pages? One good enough, you have to do the post office or the house. No, you have to just post one in whatever government building. There's one other addition that I want you to make note of. Please write this down because I couldn't photocopy it and put it on here. On the very first page of your notice document on page 118, at the very bottom left-hand side, starting from the left corner going inbound, take either a sticky pad, I need to sit down a minute, folks, a sticky pad or a three by five card, and you write on that, this document must be posted for 60 days. You don't have to say 61 on it because you already know that anyway. But put, and underneath that, put the starting date write starting date and then 7th of June 2014 to you know 6th of August 2014. Yes. So if you go and check it, it's not there, when it's taken down, then that is correct. I would suggest checking it once a week is what I recommend. And when you go to check it, take an extra copy with you. The copy that you post on the bulletin board, one other item, at the top right hand, remember, you are not posting the original one on the bulletin board. You keep that safe and sound. After the 61 day, then you take that one and you take it to the county recorder to get it recorded. Okay? I'm sorry, what was your question again? Oh, yes. Okay. Take a, a copy at the very top right hand corner of that. Do write true copy and initial it with your initials underneath of it. Okay? If you've got to replace it three times, then have the document that you stapled at the bottom of how long it needs to be there and the true copy at the top. Okay? Does that answer your question? Or? Well, if, if you started it and you had it up for two weeks, somebody took it down. Then put another one up. Then does it start from it? No, 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 no. Your time is good from the day you post it. Now let's talk about the posting of the document. When you post a document, you take a witness with you. Very, very important. Take your cell phone or a camera, and when that's stuck up there, you take a picture of it. Try to have somebody that will come back with you 61 days later. The same person. When that's completed, then have that witness do an affidavit of fact. On such and such and date, I accompanied Joe Blow to the, you know, Kalispell Courthouse for the purpose of posting an updated uh, land patent that consisted of eight, nine pages on the thing. We arrived at 1026 and we left at 1103 or whatever, okay? 
have the same person come back when you pick it up and state exactly what you did, the time you got there, that the, the land patent document was removed. If there is a removal of your document from that board at any time, then you log that. You make note of that. I was here on this date. When you go each week, you write that down in your book. You keep a log of when you posted it, and you keep a log when you went to check it. If you replaced it, you log that down. You keep records. Okay? Any other questions about that? At the end of that 61-day period, at any time thereafter, you can take it to the county recorder. Now, I want to talk about the county recorder. We've had a number of problems with county recorders who refuse to record the documents. And I am here to tell you, and we will turn to this in just a moment here. Turn to page 128. This is important. This document is titled, Patents Entitled to Recording. If you have a county recorder that says, I'm not going to record that, they have now violated federal law. And let me explain something to you. A county recorder is the custodians of land conveyance records. The original person that got the land patent that has affected your property that you're doing was required by patent law. He has to go to the county recorder to get it recorded to complete the process. People think that the patent is, is finalized when it's signed by the president. And I can tell you that that is not the case. The law requires it must be recorded. Yes, ma'am. If it's an, on an Indian reservation. Hang on just a second. If that's on the Indian reservation, that also applies? No, they're a separate, they're a separate nation. <clears throat> Although, I've had some Indian cases. I'm, I, I'm not really sure about that, but I do know that Indian reservations, they're, they're, they're under a whole different jurisdiction. But a lot of times they follow the same pattern, okay? Yes? Well, um, in this area, the reservation is overlapping several counties. And you know, so its boundaries are within the county boundaries. So people who are on the reservation with homesteads or intending to bring their land patent forward will go to the county courthouse yes. off of reservation. That is correct. And That's it's correct. been done in Sanders already. Correct. That's correct. If, if their property is under the patent and that reservation overlap, that they would still come to the county recorder's office to record it. That's correct. The county recorder has a fiduciary responsibility by law to record any land conveyance document. They are not allowed by law to interpret law. They can have in-house policy as long as that policy does not violate the law. You, as a landowner and a patent owner, are superior. You're giving instruction to your paid employee, that being servants of the people, to do what you're requesting to do. And the reason that you want to have it recorded, it fulfills the patent law requirement, number one. And number two, it allows people who have an interest to see what the land is or who owns the land or whatever can go to the record. They're public records. Okay? So don't let anybody tell you that they, that they are not going to uh, record your document. And I want to get into that. You need to know what you're talking about. The first one I put up there has to do with my own state and the statute requiring land patents to be recorded. Judgment and official grants record ability evidence. The ORS 93.680, and there's more parts to that. In other words, the state statutes require these documents that have to be. 
Well, let me ask you the question, the lady that does real estate here. What happens to, so that you share with the people, what happens when you've got a buyer and a seller and the buyer doesn't ever go and record the document? It's still in the seller's name. Bingo. Thank you. See, you authenticate a transaction by recordation. You also authenticate standing relative to that recordation. Now, I want to go on. The following are entitled to recording of the record to deed to the county, that means land patents, etc., of which the land lie, in a like manner with the effect of a conveyance of land, duly acknowledged, proved, and certified. Why do you suppose we're certifying our document? They cannot be refused lawfully. And we find some county reporters that are in fact doing just that. And we're going to get into the problem that they create for themselves by doing that. Okay? This list that I have, one through uh, number one and A, B, C, and number two, etc., are what the requirements under or the Oregon ORS, and I won't go into those for the sake of time. You can read them. But it, these are required to be recorded. Okay? Failure to do so in further... Uh, charges under the Tweed and Crimean documents. You're saying, well, what's a Tweed? Tweed was a, a law, a case that addressed the issue of recordation. And when they challenged that in that uh, Tweed case, the federal court told them, listen, you better figure out that you've got to go back and record these documents because they are lawful land conveyances, okay? Now, down to the two wit. Requirements to record. This is in your book, so you don't know unless you want to make notations of it. Title 18, United States Code, Section 2071. The federal statute said that it is a requirement to record. It's a federal offense. Title 18 is the criminal statute of the federal law. Pretty serious stuff, if you hear what I'm saying. And it gives a case. Bifle versus Morton Rubber. 1990 case, not too far back. An instrument is deemed in law. Listen to how this is stated. An instrument is deemed in law at the time of its deliverance to the clerk, regardless of whether the instrument is file marked. I want to give you a case in point. I helped the lady down in Placerville, California. Sharp gal. Really got her stuff together, and she got her land patent process and did everything need to be done. And she said, what do I do now? And I said, take it to the county recorder and get recorded. And it's pretty, and pretty sharp. She said, well, what if they won't record it? I said, lay it on the counter and do not touch it. Back away from it. Okay? What did I just read you? It's recorded and deemed recorded the moment that you deliver it. When you let go of that document on the counter recorder death, by law, it's recorded. Now, we're going to get into some law of what happens if they destroy that document or alter it or throw it in the trash or don't record it. Okay? Yes? It's probably good to have a witness with you. Pardon? It's probably good to have a witness with you. Well, she had a witness and they turned her down anyway. And then she called me on my cell phone. What do I do? I said, leave it there. Come on home. And we're going to sue those people. It's going to be fun. <laughs> No, the point that I'm making here, people, I don't like to swing a hatchet at anybody. But when you have public servants that are no longer servants and virtually want to stomp on your throat, it's time to take some action. I'm a Yaqui Indian. If you wonder what Yaquis are, I'm the southern, my family heritage is the southernmost part of the Apache, Chiricahua, Muscaleros. We love to fight. You want to bring an issue up, let's get it on. 
and I wear that brand all over. When I was in high school, I used to do a, get in a lot of fights. Not of my own doing, my, my buddies drank, and I didn't. When they got their butt kicked, come on, Ron, and I was quite a fighter. I boxed, I uh, got a belt in karate, you know, been years since I've done it. But the point of it is, you want to get in the scrap. That's why I guess I do the legal stuff. Maybe God is saying, because you're ability to stand in there and fight, I do what I do. I don't like the fight, but I'm not afraid of the fight either. Okay? Yes, sir, you had a question. Actually, yeah, it was addressed. Okay. I was just going to say, if, if there's a possibility that uh, when you go to the recorder's office and, the, and it's going to be recorded, and he mentioned it, it would be a good idea to have a witness. Absolutely. Him, so that there's somebody to yes. say that they refused it. Yes. You want to take a witness with you in any of this stuff, and somebody who will write you an affidavit, and you need to ask them that before you take the witness. And we're all done when you do an affidavit of fact. And all that is is their testimony of the fact. Don't put any fluff in it. Don't misrepresent anything. State it like it is. What's wrong with the truth? Yes, sir. Well, this question, do you give them copies? Do you give them the original and you keep a copy? I'm sorry, do what again? When you lay it out there and you have difficulty, do you give them the, the original copy to the original or do you give them a copy? No. The originals, it's required that you have to present an original. Blue ink. Blue ink, always sign your documents in blue ink, put that in notation. Blue ink. Why is that? It identifies the original. When you photocopy it, it's black. Some color photocopy, but they're not authentic. And if the, the recorder's office are sharp and paying attention, they don't have to take that, that, that document. Present the original. That's why you have three certified copies of your patent. If they take that or it's damaged or lost or whatever, make your other true copy and put your other patent document with it. But you want the original patent because it has the original certification on it and it's so marked. Then they, that verifies that you brought them certified documents. Now, when you're done, if they go and record it, you get a certified copy back. Cost you 30 or 40 bucks. You're saying, well, why would you do that when I put a certified copy in? And now your document is irreputable. Cannot be disputed. And you know it's been reported. Well, puts the county on the hook. They now have to defend you because the authorized person certified your document back out. Now you can take this document to court. Somebody wants to foreclose on your property? Got a problem here, people. I got a certified copy. The court has to accept the certified copy. They have to. You see where we're going with this? Proper planning prevents poor performance. Make sure you do what needs to be done. Yes? So you're taking to the recorder your original certified copies of everything, the, uh, the, the original land patents, you take your sandwich, okay, seven it. or eight pages. And you don't take your whole pile that you've got certified. That's kept in a safe place. You're taking your copy. Your, your true copy? No. no. You're making a summary. That's what that summary is for. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have a foot and a half pile of paper. So uh, you're taking this. this summary of the, of the transfers. You do those pages between what I mentioned to you at the start. I forget what the page what is. Right? They're 126. Okay. And, but all of these, these documents. It'll be seven or eight right? pages. But these are your original documents that you're taking to the recorder? Your yes. original certified. Yes. You make up an original and then you make up a true copy. The true copy goes on the bulletin board. But the true copy is kept safe until that process time, 61 days, is completed. Then you go home and you get your original. You go with your witness to the county recorder. Said, would you please record my document? And if they say they don't, then you take copies of what I'm sharing with you here now, and let's go forward with that. 
to show that they are required by federal law to do the recordations. Right. Down at the bottom, an instrument, as I read, I want to read it again, an instrument is deemed in law, in law, no way around it, in law, not at law, in law, which means that it's a lawful file at the time it is delivered to the clerk, regardless of whether the instrument is file marked. That's what your witness is going to testify. Joe Blow put it on the counter, and the county recorder says they're not going to file it, but I witnessed that it was placed there relative. And you quote this case and this statute here, Title 18, Section 2071. Yes? How can you tell if they actually do document it? You have to stand and watch? How can you have proof that they have actually done it? Hang on a second. They give you a reception number. They give you a reception number. How do they confirm that they have documented it? Do you stand there and watch them, or what? No, they'll usually take it back to the room where they do that, to their photocopy, and then they'll photocopy every page, and then they'll stamp it. And then you have something in your hand indicating that they have done it. And then they'll give it back to you, or they'll mail it back, whichever the case is. Okay. In our counties, they give it back to you. They ask you to wait. And it'll take them five minutes, and then they'll take it back, and they'll put it through the photocopier in the same pattern that you present it. That's why it's important to present it, because now the first page on that is your notice of your certificate of acceptance and declaration. And if they mail it, how much time would you give them to get it back to you? Well, you'll get it back probably in a week. If it's over three weeks, I'd say, hey, that's why you take your witness. We brought a document in here, and you said you'd mail it. Yes, sir. I'll ask it to where, in our county, they'll do it right on the spot, and they'll put up a reception number, the date, the time, the pages, the book, and the page, and who did it, and they give it right back. Exactly. The longest I've ever been is 20 minutes, and that's because something else came up. Yes. There's some inconsistency then in Montana, because I've had to wait more than a couple of weeks for a return, and I called to find out what the delay was. Oh, the state office in Helena is slow-staffed, and they're micro-fishing things. So it'll take, and then soon after that, it was returned to us. We got a kind of a shuffle around about it. Well, it's always subject to extenuating circumstances. But what I'm saying is, you know, it's not always on, because they were blaming it on Helena's micro-fish slowdown. So they're putting things on micro-fish in Helena. You know, you run into situations that don't fit the exact time frame that we'd like. Hang on just a second. Yes. Ron, just to clarify, you're saying that even if the county records and hands you back your original, you still want to get a certified copy? Yes. Before they give it back, ask them. Now, they will go to their file. They won't certify the one you hand them. You'll have to pay for another document. They'll photocopy it out of their file, certify it, and give it back. And ask for that before you receive the original back? Well, it doesn't matter. But what you're going to walk away with then is two documents. The one you presented that they got registered, recorded, not registered. That's another thing I almost forgot. You had a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Never, never, never register your land. Record it. You're saying why that? When you register your land, you've just given it away. There are, in law, when you register land, you are conveying that to the county. The county takes it. That is a conveyance from them, from you to the state. All you want is that land recorded, not registered. And I've got court cases on it. I do not know where it all derived from originally. I just found it in my research. But it was very explicit in the writer of this thing. It said, do not register your land. Let me give you an example. Be with you just a moment now. 
What do you do when you buy a vehicle? What do you have to do? Register. Guess who owns the title? The state. When you buy a brand new vehicle, there's a, a document that a company from, from Detroit or Japan or whatever called the Manufacturer of Origin. When you go and buy a new car and you sign it, they don't give you that. That's a true title. They send to the state. They just rob you of your, of your title, your true title. So they give you a certificate of title, which is color of title. All you have is usage of that. I know a guy who was suing the state for unpaid driver's wages. <laughs> no, he is. And I think that he'll win. I mean, the court's going to win up. And then go to the top. And the reason that he's doing it, he got a citation. He said, I'm not a corporate. And he wasn't even guilty of it, but he got it anyway. But <clears throat> so he decided then, well, I'm not the corporate. So when he made that known, the judge said that his corporate, his, uh, corporate capital letter deal stood. He hadn't done the proper paperwork to dispense that assumption of a corporate entity. So then he said, okay. And on the, on the court record, he said, Your Honor, he said, what you're telling me is that the state owns the vehicle. I'm just the driver. Is that correct? Because that's what I got cited for. And the court said, that's correct. He said, thank you. So he went out filed a lawsuit for unpaid wages since he was 16 years old. <laughs> it's about 800 and, I forget what the number is. It's over $800,000. <laughs> he said, if you're going to claim that I'm a driver, because in law, driver has significant, and I put some of this in my book, driver is specific to commerce. In other words, if you're a driver, you're driving for hire. You're getting paid, and you have to be hauling a commercial product for hire. That's the legal definition of a driver. You have an inalienable right, the right of travel. God said that's your right from God Almighty. You can go anywhere you want to go without a driver's license, without insurance, and all of that other garbage. But we get fear. I'll get a ticket. Let them come and take my car. They don't even want me in their courtrooms anymore. They don't. The judge told me, get out of here. Case dismissed. I had a guy pull in front of me a year ago. March. T-boned him. Totaled my vehicle. Totaled his. He ran a stop there, a stop light. So the officer shows up to investigate. Do you have a driver license? I said, no, I'm not a driver license. Well, wrote me a citation for driving without a license. I said, that's OK. So as soon as they got the ticket on the thing, they got a little machine. Now they print out your capital letter name. <clears throat> so they printed out my name, Ronald Clinton Gibson, da 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 and so first thing I did, I sat down and I said, I do not consent to these proceedings. I do not consent to entering into a contract with the state. And therefore, I'm not a corporate subject. I perhaps am the only person that I'm aware of. And I don't say that to be tooting my horn. In law, we claim you can't prove a negative. I can in this instance. I went to the Secretary of State Corporations Division uh, website to where the registered names, corporate names are registered, and I went down to the G's. And when I got to the G's, then I took a picture of it, printed it out, and there was no Ronald Clinton Gibson. You with me so far? <laughs> they claimed that I was a corporate entity and the state of Oregon states to be a corporate entity you have to be registered with the Corporations Commission. I proved to them that I don't exist in their record. Then how can you cite me 
whatever. And then I gave them another little tidbit that strongly suggests that they better drop the case. Because I'm going to come after the officer, I'm coming after the court clerk, and if the judge takes this on and tries to prosecute, I'm going to sue the judge too. Under constructive trust fraud. Because you violated my rights by color of law. They're claiming that I'm a corporation and I proved that I wasn't. It's your choice. What do you want to do, court? That thing never showed up anywhere. They would not give me a document. They didn't have the guts to send me back that had been dismissed. Because they knew what I'd do with it. Because I've, I've dealt with them before, let's put it that way. Okay? But I'm just trying to give you the analogy, going back to your question about color of law. It's a big one. I was showing uh, Rex a document that I have. To have a social security number is, is unlawful to have a social security number. I got the documents. It's for federal employees. We are being scammed beyond belief, folks. And my prayer is that you people would, and I say this respectfully, wake up. Because if you don't take a stand, there's an old saying, and I love sayings. It says if you don't take for stand for something today, tomorrow you will fall for anything. Okay? There's a bumper sticker out. I love it. The bumper sticker said, well, two of them actually. One of them said, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? I love that. Another one said, if you think there is no hell, you better be right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I particularly want to ask you this question. <coughs> I am so confused about what sovereign means. Okay. And living within the bounds of the reservation, they claim that they are a sovereign nation. They're also a corporation. And now Impossible. the EPA has given them status as a state. Yeah. What does sovereign mean? Very simple, very good question. Let me explain to you as clearly as I know how. A sovereign is God created. Almighty God is sovereign. We, in the book of Genesis, said, it tells us, let us make man in our image. We're the only creature ever created that is made in the image of Almighty God. That's powerful, folks. That's a true sovereign. We are sovereign in this nation by creation. We are also sovereign by virtue of being our own king, king of our land. We're a child of the king, okay? The Bible tells us that over and over and over. Our problem is we don't recognize that. We don't function accordingly. But a sovereign very simply means that God created. <laughs> the sovereign nations, they call them that simply because they were a nation of sovereign people by God's creation. God made the Indians. He made the, you know, the Africans, the Canadians, the whatever. But that, to answer your question, is a sovereign. And it's in my book. Ron, do you, yeah. do you want the Black's Law Dictionary of Sovereign? Yeah, go ahead. It's real short. Black's Law is a great dictionary to use if you want to know legal definitions. Sovereign. A person, body, or state in which independent and supreme authority is vested. A chief ruler with supreme power. A king or other ruler in a monarchy. Beautiful. Thank you very kindly. Did you hear that, what you just said? Of supreme power. What are we talking about about our patent? If you have your land patent brought forward, who's the king of that land? You are. Okay? Are you, are you getting the picture here, folks? We need to rethink what we're doing. You've been indoctrinated. I've been indoctrinated. And I woke up one day and said, wait a minute. I'm going to do everything that I can to be free. I'm willing to support a lawful government and an unlawful government. I'm going to be a pain in their butt forever. 
because they're not functioning within the framework of God's intent. There's two elements of law. One of them is the intent of law, and the second part of it is the letter of the law. Our legal system and our legislators, for the most part, have come to the point of the letter of the law. Let's manipulate that. Let's twist. Let's redefine that. Beautiful representation of what you just read about a sovereign. You and I are sovereigns by our creation. God gave man the dominion over the earth. Okay? And we're not doing our job, folks. We're letting a bunch of radicals come and dictate and manipulate government officials and government as a whole, and then we wonder why things are in a mess. We need to get up, look up, get up, and move forward. God said, come and follow me. The psalmist David said, Lord, protect me by standing in front. I love that scripture. So simple, because God is in his rightful place in front. I do marriage counseling, done it for 30 years. And I get couples there that are at odds with each other, and they're battling back and forth and on the wrong track for everything. And I try to get a point to, across to them, and especially with some women that are very strong-willed, are not willing to follow their husband's leadership. On the other side, husbands have a godly responsibility to be a loving leader. Ephesians 5 says, Husband, wife, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. A lot of guys don't want to give to their wife. They want to take from her. They don't want to give themselves for, for her. And I tell the wife and the husband both, pretty difficult for a woman to follow the husband when he's parked alongside the road. If I can use that analogy. Us men have a responsibility to stand up and be leaders and lead your wife and your family in a godly direction. Amen. And if you'll do that, God said, I'll oh, bless you and bless you and bless you and bless you. Yes, someone had a, yes sir. Yeah, so once you finish the whole process and you have your patent, Pardon? Once you have your patent title, if you will, how do you, would you talk about inheritance? Uh, how do you, uh, is it taxable? Can the IRS, there's several issues there, but how do you, you're going to die sooner or later. What happens when the person in title passes? How does, where does it go? It goes to the heir, just like it says on the patent. Is it probatable? Does no, it? no. Very good question. Probate courts have no jurisdiction over land patents. That's why you don't have to worry about the state milking your estate. That's just a lawful, a legal, excuse me, not lawful, but thievery. I'm helping some people right now with an issue in Wisconsin. Sick what the courts are doing. Thievery, robbery, immoral from start to finish. I'm going to file the paperwork for her so she can sue the probate officer and the probate judge. They're robbing that estate with no just cause. Hang on just a second. Yes? Yes? Were you, oh, um, now, if someone gets the idea of doing putting a conservation easement on this patent, patented land, that doesn't match, and it destroys the patent, doesn't it? That's a contract. Uh -huh. You have the full right and authority to contract. If you do, you dilute your patent. You can't have an affidavit signed by two people because you're not two people. Well, right, but their signature to their statement doesn't need yeah. to be witnessed. Their signature is the same. Your signature, correct. Right. Didn't you say something earlier that uh, an affidavit that goes unchallenged for a period of time? 30 days. 30 days. 30 days. And then it's... Uh, stands forever. Stands forever. 
If you do an affidavit of fact, and you say that's what I did to the Department of Geology, I was telling you a story about my neighbor down there. They wanted to get as far away from me as they could get. So when I sent that last document, they knew. I let them know I'm coming after you. Yes. So you can get your patent finished. How, what's the paperwork you do to uh, send to the county, take, a, take you off the tax rolls? There's a process to do that. I will provide that to Rex. I don't want to get in that today, only because it's a, a session in itself. It's a very simple document, but it must be done correctly. Okay? But your patent land is not subject to taxes. Yes? On the topic of conservation. Easement? Yeah. If, you're, if you buy a piece of property that has one of those on, and you bring that title It depends upon how it's written. Uh, I've seen some that I can break. I've seen some because the language is that they're for long periods of time. And, and dependent whether the contract contact uh, content is in fact uh, properly done. A lot of those are done, they're not worth the paper they're written on. And some of them pretty binding, yes. If you uh, pay taxes after you've established a land patent, does that give them any leverage? If you do what again? If you pay taxes, you don't have to, but if you say you don't file the paperwork you pay taxes, does that give them some leverage like, like if you were sovereign? No, it does not. Because you can pay, you have a right to pay whoever for whatever reason that you want. The fact that they're demanding it from you and trying to force you to pay it is a whole different issue. Okay? Yes? What about commercial enterprise? I'm sorry? Commercial enterprise, if you own land and you want to start a business, are you subject to building codes or licensure? If you're under a corporation, you are because you're under contract. Like it's personally owned. If you're doing it in your own name and it's patented, then no, you're not. See, the administrative... process. It's got all of these terms and these, you know, creations of this and that. <clears throat> all that, and I want to be gut honest with you, is nothing but to manipulate you to control That's you. That's right. Corporations are fictitious entities. They're a creation, a man's creation, on a piece of paper. There's no substance to it. Not like a piece of land where there's dirt, there's trees, and there's whatever. You understand the difference of that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So if your land is under, if your land is under patent title, should you have a sign at your boundary of your property that this land is yes. under patent title? Therefore, no one can come on your property that is right. you without to post permission. It. You have to post that. But if you post that using the statutes that are applicable to trespass. If we have, I'll tell you what, let's take a 10 minute break and then come back folks and then we'll do our last segment here, okay?